Hi, everyone. Thank you for chiming in to Reckless Compliance, where we talk about public sector compliance and the unintended consequences of compliance. Today's episode is really interesting. It's actually one of the fundamental episodes. It's about authorization boundaries or scoping. We, in the commercial compliance, sometimes will refer to SOC 2 as scope statements or statement of applicability from the ISMS systems. But in the government side, this is all known as authorization boundaries or an ATO boundary. So with me, I've got a pretty amazing individual with the right kind of background. His name is Naveed. He works for Okta now. But Naveed, tell us a little bit about yourself, your history. I know you were an instructor, but for the audience who don't know who, don't know who you are, uh, give us a little bit of background. Well, thank you for having me, Max. So just a little background. I worked in the compliance arena directly for close to 20 years. The majority of that time, I was a government contractor supporting the U.S. Marine Corps. During that time, I had one AO that I worked with. I mean, this guy was was there forever and a day, fantastic human being. So, you know, we, we got along great and were able to kind of create some, you know, what I like to think of as maybe some common sense policies. And about 2021, I got the, you know, everybody was just sitting around their houses, you know, during COVID and I got the bug to maybe try something new. And I went to Okta the identity and access management company. And I've been here as a solution architect ever since. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Common sense policies. That's very much needed in the government. And uh, for those of you who are listening, AO authorization official, kind of the top dog, Naveed, right? Wouldn't you say in terms of who's actually going to approve and and essentially take on the the proposition of risk, if if any, on, on accepting it, the system. Yes, yes. And in some cases, that AO is also the person who designs the actual policy and the processes to do that. You know? Yeah, yeah. The, the AOs are pretty powerful. I think, I think yeah. one of our episodes, we actually had an AO on here, which was fantastic. So a very interesting, very interesting job that they have, right? They've got to somehow basically take on risk on behalf of the government when it comes to cybersecurity. So so definitely a compliance. And now you're at Okta, which is fantastic. I know Okta's one of the you know cutting edge products for IAM, identity access management and whatnot. So let's get into to the you know the boundary authorization. What is it? So Naveed, let's start with that. So for people that are listening who have never experienced anything with the government and you know let alone Marine Corps, just just the government what would you what is the authorization boundary? How is it formed and what's the importance of it? So I, I like to do things in analogies that some folks can maybe understand. So let's do this. If I'm building a new house, the authorization boundary isn't the house, right? Because I, mm-hmm. I am getting the house approved. I've got state, local government coming in there, checking to make sure everything in the house is built. But what about the groundwork around? Mm-hmm. What about the, you know, the, the sloping so that water doesn't kind of, you know, ingress back into the basement or the electrical, you know, coming into the to the site and things like that. So your authorization boundary is bigger than the thing you're building, but it's really the composition of the system and all of the supporting pieces that are required to make that system work. Uh, and then what you do is you wrap that all up in an engineering document and called a system security plan, which mm-hmm. doesn't sound like an engineering document, but it kind of is. And then show that authorizing official the form, fit, and function of the system and what the security, you know, test and eval looks like for it. Uh, That's a great way to put it. I've actually never heard that analogy. I think it's fantastic because when we look at authorization boundary diagrams, right, you're, you're talking about all the circuitry that might be coming into the house. It's a very different way to think about it from traditional ISMS compliance, ISO compliance, where where we might be thinking of the scope as just some loose statements. But here, if we put a engineering view into it, it's really anything that's coming into the house, anything that's going out of the house, almost sounds like a schematic of some sort. Did you ever did you ever have to draw those uh, crazy? We call them cartoon diagrams. Uh, the auth- the authorization boundary diagrams. I've had to draw many of them, you know, when I was supporting different programs as the system security engineer, and I've had to review countless 
of when I, you know, supporting the AO as one of the assessors. Yeah, I, I think there's no perfect way to do it. You know, I've seen it, I've seen it done a hundred different ways. And, and a lot of times what I've learned is that, you know, my narrative and how I draw the diagram, it really is, is not just engineering, but it's also serves as a communication piece. Yes. Because if, if my AO is so far away from technology, somehow I need to pare it down. I, I don't know if you came across that. And that's why we, we sometimes use the term cartoon diagrams, even though it's not, you know, it, it doesn't, at the end of it, doesn't resemble an engineering drawing. I don't know if you ever came across that. It's Yeah, they're, they're not formal engineering do drawings. They're not, and I'm only going to say this term once because I don't like it, DODAF, oh, but they're not right. DODAF yeah, yeah. architectures. <laughs> but my favorite explanation for them is I don't know art, but I know what I like. Um, you know, I, as an engineer, as the, the system security engineer, I need to put enough context into that diagram so that somebody who has a rudimentary understanding of security and may not understand my technologies exactly can understand what I'm uh, I'm attempting to accomplish. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to put it. And I don't like that term either, right? Dodaf. Yeah, that's that's a crazy <laughs> ball of wax that I hope we never get into on this bot podcast. But I have a suspicion <laughs> that we that'll be another break it from the another, record uh, <laughs> that'll be another topic but yeah i i think i think you're right because i've seen the fedramp diagrams out there and they try to put specifications into exactly what they want but when you actually match that up against a system let's say even okta which might have thousands of boundaries or any system any devops system that might have thousands of interconnections sometimes when you look at the spec of what you're supposed to do versus the reality, it just makes it so complex and, and it's not even worth it, right? Where, right. where you where you then have to abstract and, and essentially maybe not even abstract, but, but hey, what's the best way for me to communicate? What is it that I'm trying to, you know, certify and whatnot? Yeah. You know, did you guys have some of those kinds of things in the Marines or wherever you did uh, this work? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, uh, uh, and not just, you know, supporting the Marine Corps, but with, with some other customers as well. You know, as an analyst, one of the first things that I always wanted to do was sit down with a security manager and their engineer and really just sit down face to face, you know, uh, in the days before Zoom and uh, like, hey, tell me what you're trying to do. And I'm going to tell you if I don't understand something. All right. Like, let, let's face it. I might be brilliant, just ask me, but I, you know, I don't know everything. And so I will have to go do some research. One, the first time I ever looked at a DevSecOps pipeline was an eye-opening experience for me. It really was. Hmm. But as the analyst supporting the AO, I, I knew it was my job to kind of learn from the folks who are, you know, building it. So I always kind of treat it as that, like, teach me so I can help you. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, especially uh, especially DevOps and the DevSecOps world. There's like yeah. a thousand different ways to do things, right? Yeah. There's like Terraform, there's Kubernetes, there's containers, Docker's, and yeah. and yeah, I th I think compliance people we always kind of sometimes get behind, but we all we always got to learn. And and I would I would agree. I think the other side, even the DevOps people, they're continuously learning as well. Um, yeah, and the, and the interesting thing here is, is that the government from an engineering, well, the government from an IT practice standard normally mm -hmm. lags five to 10 years behind, right? I mean, yeah, that's we're, right. We're that's, really that's starting being kind. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, so, so cloud hit me when it was really a mature thing. So, so I got to miss a lot of the infancy of cloud. I got to see the t-shirts. It's not a cloud. It's just somebody else's computer. You know, those kind of things yeah. for the first 10 years, laughed at it and said, well, we'll never go there. And then one day we go there. Uh, but by then it's a little bit more mature. So the learning curve is I've got to learn a mature technology. But if I actually have someone developing a new system using those technologies, I've got somebody to ask. Just don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, no, that's the key. I think a lot of people in the compliance side of the house, we tend to know what these things are, but then how it applies to real world systems. Yep. I feel like we're we're severely behind. Talking about the DevOps environment, have you had the opportunity to kind of participate? What because because a lot of things, you know, it's really hard to 
figure out how to do a boundary. So for those that are listening, right, Naveen, let's say that we they don't even know what goes into it. So what what do you what typically goes into this boundary? And then let's figure out like where does it apply in terms of DevOps and the cloud, those kinds of things. In your experience, what are some of the key things that you cannot leave behind when it comes to a boundary? Okay. So I'm going to answer this in two parts. So the first part is that DevSecOps environment itself. So that's all of your development tools, the environment that you're developing the code in, the practices that you are using to develop that code. That's oh. part of that boundary, mm -hmm. right? You know, so all of that kind of goes in there. So you were talking about Kubernetes and you know, and all those different tools uh, down to what development languages are being used. And if you really want to get down into it, what approved libraries are being used and how those are being managed. Because at the end of the day, the whole idea of a DevSecOps pipeline is to build secure applications mm -hmm. and then minimize the authorization process for those. So instead, it may take you a year to build the pipeline and get it accredited, but those applications should come out the end already being accredited. And that's yeah. kind of the yeah. goal is I can build that speed line for the applications that I need to build because I've done all of that work up front. So, so for a DevSecOps environment, it's all of the tools, all of the processes have to be kind of covered in that boundary. Is it going to be a diagram? Well, I can't put the processes on a diagram. I can build process diagrams, I guess. But it's part of that boundary, and it's part of the discussion that needs to happen when I'm really talking about how I'm ensuring that I'm building secure applications you know, through this thing. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I, I think that's that's important because at the end of the day, it's really about trying to bake in security you know, in different ways. And the diagram might just be the output that that we need to help somebody understand. But I'm I'm glad you mentioned you went all the way down to like S bombs, you know, the, the software bill of material, the libraries, things like that. Because I, I don't think a lot of people realize that this this doing this authorization thing or the boundary is not I write a couple of statements and then I've formed it, you know, it, it's getting down to the nitty gritty of how the system works. To your point, you mentioned, hey, I got to sit down with their systems engineer or their security engineer and really understand the inside of it. So, you know, with the DevSecOps, what I find, what, what I find really difficult to grasp is that the notion of boundary is kind of like, okay, we have a boundary and things are supposed to stay in that boundary. And if they go out, we're supposed to be able to document it. But man, it just seems like the pace of the software and how fast we're moving, it kind of breaks the entire paradigm of a boundary. It it does because just the word boundary itself is the castle moat, right? Yeah, that's uh, right. And, and, and we still use the term, but I think it's changed. It, it, it has to evolve or we just go back to on-prem networks with firewalls, you, you know? So it, it's why I keep going back to part of your boundary is the business processes you use to manage your environment. If you have an AWS account, you've got business processes on who can manage it, how they manage it, mm -hmm. you know, things that they are allowed to change, things they're not allowed to change. And that's part of the boundary because at the end of the day, your boundary is a virtual DMARC zone in somebody else's computer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the, one of the other paradigms that I've been seeing out there is that you're accrediting the process. I don't know if you've heard of that term. Hey, no, we're accrediting hey. the process, not the stuff in it, the stuff that comes out of it, whether yes. it's a software factory, whatever. Yes. That's secured because we, we baked in the secure software development, but really we're trying to accredit a process on how people exactly. work together. That, that is, that is, and, and I didn't know this when 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 we started down this way. We were building a, a the Marine Corps' first DevSecOps pipeline, and 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 I was learning as I was going and writing policy as I was going. So so that was kind of an interesting time. But you know, just had a good group of people who were everybody was just willing to kind of you know help the security guy understand, <laughs> help the yep. the compliance yep. guy understand. But also part of me, my job was 
to take those compliance requirements and figure out when they should and shouldn't apply. Compliance is fantastic. If I'm dealing with a you know a Windows server, mm -hmm. compliance really is not fantastic when I'm dealing with you know a container. Yeah, talk to me about that, Naveen. Like, how does like in your mind, right? How does how is that changed? You know, because um, I agree with you. We struggle a lot in, in just the whole boundary. Just that word alone. It's a terrible yeah. word, but but that's what it is. That's that's really what it says, right? You can't argue what it says. But how has that changed in in your mind? Well, so like, let's go back to the Dev, DevSecOps, you know, answer or example. Um, maybe what I'm fielding, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll make this really simple, is is a platform as a service application, mm -hmm. you know, type of a system where, you know, it's got its own high level logic code that somebody can come in there and develop an application, push it to the server. And we won't even get into containers. And that application runs within the context of the server. The server itself all of the development practices are part of that DevSecOps pipeline. I know that that server or server stack is accredited. Security is being properly maintained. Somebody's monitoring, doing all those things. So now I'm just worried about the data and business processes that are in that application. Yeah, that make yeah that yeah the way I see it is like you, you know that that makes sense. I mean, in on the traditional side, we used to call them I think general support systems or something. And then uh, we're just, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. like we're pushing them, like everything underneath it. So like the platform as a service is accredited, but then everything you push on top of it, you know, it's kind of becomes its own boundary. I hate to use that word boundary, but I feel like, I feel like. But they are. Because they are, they are. Very much, it has a different owner, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got the app guys who may own the stack, but the application that I've written Different owner, different data set, you know, mm -hmm. could be a different AO depending on the branch of service you're in, you know, but yeah, yeah, you're what right. Am I from that platform. Yeah, that's a that's a whole another ball of wax, man. Inheritance, you know, that's like <laughs> but it's it's the it's the crux of the whole thing, right? Yeah. Is yeah. if if I define my boundaries, like there's there's two modes of thought. Mega boundary where I put everything in one big boundary. And I can do everything other than maintain the accreditation every three years because I've got 200,000 line items and tests to run every three years. And it's all one group of people. But that, that doesn't work in the modern It doesn't work, yeah. And, and, and I'm not kidding. I've actually seen a uh, a data center that had 200,000 line items in its wow. test plan. Yeah. In, the, uh, in yeah. their plan. That's, that's in their yeah, test plan. break it down. Yeah, yeah. Stigs, stigs exponentially increase the number of security checks you have to do. You know, so so break it up into manageable chunks and then you reuse things. So, you know, now I've got that application service provider that may support five different application owners. They all have very small mm -hmm. ATO packages under that old, old GSS major and minor application. Yep, yep, I remember They're that. They're minor yeah. applications. Yeah, no, you're right. And and I think that's the that's where we should go. But man, everybody wants to. Did you ever? Did you ever feel like everybody wants to shove everything into the boundary because they think they'll get an ATO for everything? Did you ever? You ever come across those kinds of? I, I have seen people do that, and a lot of times, and, and there's a balancing act. Like yep. I, I've looked at one, you know, major data center, and I was like, hey, if I split this up into three accreditation boundaries. A year or two years from now, when you want to build the second data center, I can reuse some of this and you have a much more streamlined authorization path instead of two big, two big ones here. I make yep. one big yep. one here, but make it reusable, make that inheritance yeah. model work. So if you break off the management piece, right? So your control yep. plane, your management plane, if it's going to be the same between the two, break it out. So I have two data centers and one control plane. It kind looks it. I'm managing three packages instead of two, but I'm only managing the control plane once instead of twice. Wow. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, that's what we're trying to do with a lot of people, right? But <laughs> I've ran into challenges where the AO or the program office, you know, they just want to do a single ATO and it's a giant boundary. They just want to shove everything in. So I say the politics get in the way of like good sound 
engineering or and architectural pr practices. Yeah. So having been the guy on the other side of the fence, you know, I'm I'm sure that there are probably people who are going to watch this podcast and be like, that Naveed made me do something, you know. Yeah. And uh and 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 maybe there's a mea culpa moment here in that the AO personal belief, I don't believe that the AO or SEA should force somebody to follow a particular accreditation boundary the way they see it. You're yeah. not the system owner, you don't own it. You can give advice. And you can give strong advice like, hey, by the way, this will be easier. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't take your advice and they come back six months later and say, this is too hard, you can then do the I told you so dance. And that would be fun. But but I, I just don't feel that you should force somebody to follow a certain boundary unless there is specific policy that says they cannot do what they're coming yeah, and I I hundred percent agree with that because the people that are closest to the system that really understand it, I think those are the people that are actually going to understand how to do the security of it. Now the compliance is another piece, yeah. um, but but yeah, that that's how I always kind of you know that's how boundaries are typically formed in the government is like oh there's a program record great, that's a One boundary. boundary for this program. <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right and and what ends up happening is that we end up stifling innovation i know we're supposed to be talking about the boundary but when when innovation always comes in like small chunks right like hey there's this there's this nice little software let's let's build it there's a nice little library that plugs into multiple softwares right that's mm -hmm. that's what's happening and i feel like this whole boundary notion is is against that innovation to some degree but breaking it up is the key if we can get if we can get other people on board i guess you could say because that 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 i don't know if you if you uh ever felt that but when you're on the other side like on the government side whether you're a contractor or a civilian you have a lot of say in terms of how somebody is going to do something and it it yeah. could be the wrong way to do it altogether yeah and and that's you know so, so a little bit of a soapbox, you know, when, when I first started, I was in my early twenties, you know, no, my boss said, we're going to do it this way and we're going to do it this way. And then after a while, you kind of just learn to sit down, have the conversation, try to figure out where you might be wrong. Yeah. Like again, I'm brilliant. Just ask me, but I've been wrong before I'm married. Trust me. I've been wrong yeah. before. And, and, and you, you got to kind of have the dialogue, figure out, like, you know, it's your system. I can give you recommendations. I can tell you what the policy is. I can tell you how I would do it, right? Yeah. And, and, and if you choose to wrap everything in one big program of record package, you know, boundary, then by all means, carry forward and do great things. Um yeah. 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 I've seen a lot of people accrue, we call it compliance debt, right? Like, oh yeah. man, I shouldn't have done it that way. But you're right. Some of this stuff within the boundary can be totally abstracted out, like management controls, things like that, which is nice. You know, I, I did a LinkedIn post on this, Naveed, and we've got some interesting responses from a lot of different people. John Allison, I think he's been in the community for quite some time. He he's a prior Air Force guy. He's working at Check Marks, the source code analysis tool. Ian, who's over at Tanium. One of the things you mentioned is, hey, this is very similar. It's got a it's got some relationships to systems thinking, and 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 you know, bit of like design and and systems. And so tell us about that. What do you what did you mean by that, and how is that related to this? So there's there's the older concept of systems and systems of systems. Right. And and really, at the end of the day, that's kind of the boundary. Like, you know, I'll, I'll be very DOD for a moment. A system has a mission and what it, all of the components it needs to accomplish that mission should be part of its system. Now, does that mean that they're not broken up into systems of systems? Like, you know, maybe, like I said, the control plane might be a subsystem. You know, the U, UI, you know, user, you know, input side Everybody might be another yep. system, you know, so you can, you can break those things out into those logical, those logical bit buckets. And if you can break those out into logical bit buckets, 
now it's really just a matter of does each bit bucket become its own boundary? Can I do sub boundaries in there? One of the things in the Marine Corps that, that we really tried to tackle when we built our GRC tool. So the Marine Corps, for those of you who do DOD, everybody uses EMAS except for yeah. the Marine Corps. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and, and when we designed our tool, we tried to build in the capability to do essentially like metadata tagging. So yeah. these components are part of this subsystem. So then that way I could do some neat things. Like if I were going to swap out everything as part of one subsystem, I had a way to do that and sort yeah. of semi-containerize it within the one boundary. So we tried to build, build in that capability. Again, the more capabilities you add to something, the harder it gets for the end user. So your mileage may vary there. Uh, but we, we did try to build that in uh, so that I could then take maybe an entire base and I could do one boundary for a military base. Okay, but now that military base is composed of the, you know, the the cable plant, the network. Yep. But it's also composed of the the telephone system, which may be on its own network. Or what about all of the facility control systems that mm -hmm. may be on their own network? Well, those are all part of the base, but are they subsystems? So it. And it depends now if all of those things are owned by the same organization at, the, at a particular base, roll them all together and tag them as subsystems. If they have different owners, make three different packages and inherit controls from each other. Yeah, no, that, that I see what you're saying, like in terms of creating a bunch of subsystems and, and I I've used another, I've heard another term like sub SSPs and things like that, but Man, looking at the same controls, I, I think we got to get better at interpretation of the controls because once we get down to um, my administrative policies are all taken care of by the base or or my physical security, right? There's literally a guard fence. Like, don't even show me those controls in my little tiny boundary that I'm dealing with because somehow, in, you know, this whole ATO thing takes a long freaking time. <laughs> that's you know what though you, you hit one of the hard problems and, and this is by the way this is a database problem okay yeah. this is a database data management problem that you're bringing up right now but it is one of the the one of the really big areas where i think the 853 controls and some of the, the other nist guides for like how to apply those controls are kind of broad stroke right now mm -hmm. so i define a system and i get 400 controls so that means 400 controls across this system. It doesn't mean that each component has all those controls. It doesn't mean that each subsystem needs all those controls. So how do I then, if I'm breaking something up into a subsystem or you know a set of subsystems, how do I apply controls logically to that? How do I make sure that the server in a closet somewhere doesn't have a gates guard gun requirement on it that's already being met by the base. And that's kind of where doing a subsystem design and mm -hmm. trying to really figure out that inheritance model comes in really handy. Yeah, I, I agree. So I, I'm reading another comment. There's this guy, I can't pronounce his last name. It's a Polish last name, Brian. I've talked to him before. He's a really smart guy over at Tanium Cloud. He said, honestly, it was far easier to have an ATO package as a DOD and Fed versus FedRAMP where it's where everything is kitchen in the sink. And I think what he's getting at is because a lot of the FedRAMP systems, their boundaries, right? You, at Okta, I'm sure it's the same kind of thing. You're, you're dealing with so many different cloud systems that are coming in. And when you, you know, when you try to interpret that control, that technocratic control that could mean both policy and technology, Man, I, I think it's just like super challenging for a lot of people who are not in the DOD, you know, and they're trying to work with the DOD and the FedRAMP Heisman is what they got to face, right? They're like, ah, get out of here. It's well, yeah. So, so, so yes, one of the interesting things in because it, there is a kitchen sink paradigm, but there's a kitchen sink paradigm for a good reason. If I'm bringing a system into a Marine Corps owned and operated cloud environment or physical data center. Hmm. Who is my cybersecurity service provider? Well, it's whoever that the branch of service is currently using. 
you know, maybe maybe you've got you're, you're an army system and it's, you know, armies, you know, I can't remember their name now all of a sudden. Maybe it's the McCaug if you're the Marine Corps, right? You know, the yep. Marine Corps Operations Group. And they're acting as your, your CSSP. I'm Okta. Who's my CSSP? Well, it's Okta. So yeah, now yeah. I have to field all of those controls. I, I don't have anything I can inherit. I can inherit some of my boundary protections from my cloud service provider. I can right. inherit, you know, from other, you know, providers out there. If I'm using their tools, maybe I can inherit some stuff from them. But largely, I'm taking everything from platform and SaaS, right? PaaS and yep. SaaS, and I'm doing it myself. So yeah, yeah I, I think it, yeah. it's harder. It it's way harder. It's way harder, especially when you, when you put it in the, in that sort of context with, you know, with, with what's going on with, with Okta and stuff like that. And man, I feel for you guys. <laughs> you, you know what? I think the more you get beat up, the bigger you are. Right. So, so maybe it's a good sign. It may, maybe so, maybe so, but, but yeah, I, I think kind of back to the, you know, the point of this discussion is trying to help people understand what is a boundary and and i think we've done that in this short segment in terms of it, it's a lot more granularity and detail than just your simple SOC 2 controls right a lot of, a lot of people are like oh i got my SOC 2 i'll just take the description there and call it my boundary but it's it's far more detailed than that and then you know in, in terms of trying to figure out how to leverage systems engineering practices I, I think that's the key. That's the key. You, you, we've got to break this down into smaller chunks to make it manageable. Because without it, it, it sounds like it's nearly. It's going to take a year, no matter what we do. Yeah, yeah. And now, soapbox time. But you know, you, you hit the nail on the head earlier when you said bake in security, and we've always said that. But then we always like, well, it takes me a year to get my ATO. Well, it should have taken you a year to build the system. Yeah, right. Yeah. And 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 the ATO should have been being developed at the same time. That ATO package, that boundary, that system security plan should have been developed as part of the systems engineering effort, not the afterthought. And and so a lot of folks and, and I always catch people, myself included, like, what might take a year to get the ATO? Well, did it take a year to build the system? Because that should have been the same year. Yeah. No, I, I think I, I agree with you largely, but man, there are systems that are coming online so fast. Yeah. Apps, especially SaaS environment, right? Like if you've got a platform, an infrastructure, large application, it's going to take some planning. and Absolutely. And especially for those of us in the commercial industry that are trying for that FedRAM or, you know, the analogous uh, on the, the uh, on the DOD side, which is the the cloud security requirements grant, the cloud SRG, yep. you know, uh, going through that. We, we've already got a developed stack. We already have a developed system. We're just trying to expand to support a new type of customer. Yep. And so now we definitely aren't, we baked in security. We didn't bake in DOD standards. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. And, and, and so now we're going back and we're retrofitting to bake in those DOD standards. And that, that's going to take at least a year. You're lucky yeah. if it took a year. Yeah, that's the reality. People don't like hearing that, but that's really what what it is. But so one of, one of my one of my things, I, I get a lot of friends. You know, a lot of my friends are in, in you know security, obviously, in 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 the commercial sector now. And the the one piece of advice I always tell anybody is, oh, you you're going to go work for a startup? Yeah, what are you using for security requirements? Ah, you know, some industry best practices. Hey, how about you open up NIST eight hundred fifty three? And go ahead and figure out what security controls you need to meet and start there. Because one day, if you are successful, you will want to service government customers. Yeah. They're recession proof. They, they are. <laughs> and and hopefully we change that one day. But for, for the long haul, it's just it's it's there. Yeah. It's not it's not yeah. gonna change. Well, and, with that. Folks don't want to hear that when you tell them, "Hey, just start yeah. out with this 853." No, they're, they're like, "Get out of here!" here. They're, ah. they're like, "What are you? What are you talking about?" You know, We're a hyper growth tech company. Yeah. We don't need to fall. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, yeah. I mean, if you if you look at the real hyper growth tech companies, they'll grow and then they'll do it, or they'll do it from the get go, right? Like yeah. I, I think um, 
if we look at Okta story, same thing. They grew, but then they said, okay, we want to work with federal. Yeah. They had to do it. They 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 weren't 100%. like, well, no, we're just we're super big, we're super massive, we don't have to do it. No, you you may hack the process once, but to to build a sustainable business as a SaaS firm, it's one of those things you got to do. And you know what we found though that was really interesting. So so I wasn't on the compliance side of, in Okta, but you know so but what, what what we found is that the government is actually there to help. Like they want commercial vendors to mm -hmm. meet their requirements. So you know it it really does feel like you know they're you know all the different agencies that are working towards like FedRAMP, you know certifications things like that. They they want us they want there, to help. yeah, and and they want to make it, you know, less difficult, <laughs> you know. So it's it's not the did you fill out the ID ten T form? It's like hey, just provide me this data. Yeah, no, especially with you guys. I think, I mean, look, it's credentials, right? Like, it's <laughs> it's 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 necessary, and I, and I would hope that they want to be helpful when it comes to like identity management, you know, yes. um, that it's, it's super critical and you're hundred percent, right. It's, you know, no matter, you can't even outsource the cybersecurity watchdog truly because it's, it's all coming out of your business application, your logic, yes. and they're not going to understand it. It's not traditional SIM data that you can look at and correlate. So yeah, exactly. Very interesting boundary for sure. <laughs> very interesting boundary so well man i really appreciate you coming on the podcast i think for those that are listening in that have never experienced what a boundary is i, I think this 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 is going to be one of the fundamental kind of lessons that we put together but any parting thoughts anything else you'd like to mention for those that are just kind of maybe listening to this and they're understanding the concept of a boundary for a very first time uh, so, so for the new practitioners that are kind of, you know, hear, hearing about this for the first time, maybe, you know, definitely learn that process. Like, you know, I, I, I kind of hate saying pick up 837 and read it because you'll fall asleep. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a big boy, but, but understand what the steps are there for. Uh, you know, it, it's very easy to get caught up in the, oh my goodness, this is just paperwork. Uh, but if you actually look at what each step of that process is trying to do, it's actually trying to do something important. So if you understand those steps, then you really can kind of, you know, separate the the fluff from the important stuff. You know, it's not always about filling out the ID 10T form. Oh my goodness, do I need another MOA, you know, to 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 cover, you know, do I need another agreement with somebody else to to do this thing? Or can I just really look at what the data is and decide, is this security relevant or not? Awesome. Well, with that, David, we appreciate your time. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Appreciate you.